This is the Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 1st Edition Dungeon Master's Guide. In this book, among the rules and advice for game masters, both helpful and questionable, are a variety of appendices. These have everything from random tables for creating your own dungeons and world maps to pages of critical reference tables. Among these is Appendix N, a list of recommended works of fiction that can spur your inspiration as a dungeon master and as a player. Included because heroic fantasy and swords and sorcery were not as well known then as it was today. Other RPG books since then, including other editions of D&D, have continued the tradition of providing recommended works of fiction to spur players and game masters, later going on to include television series, comics, and films as well. However, generally, these sections omit works of anime. It's time to rectify that. This is the Anime Appendix N. Having gone through the fantasy section of our anime appendix end, before we get into our next genre or subgenre of this game, cyberpunk, I want to get into a little bit of a sidebar here. That's be our term for fun episodes to get into why to have an appendix and or other form of recommended um, media, whether it reading, viewing, listening to, what have you, in the first place. It's a good question to ask, partially because, well, some tabletop games just have, at well, least these days, a reduced recommended reading section in the first place. Cyberpunk Red's recommended reading, while it includes a little bit of anime, is also really short, basically serving as a fairly small sidebar. Numenera, which also has a little anime, is longer, but still not particularly long. Dungeons Dragons 5th Edition, on the other hand, has about a full page of recommendations, while indie mecha RPG Lancer has none at all. So what purpose or purposes does a recommended serve for the GM or player, and what should a GM keep in mind when preparing their own similar? First off, the list sets the expectations for the GM. If you watched part one of the episodes for fantasy, you may remember that I introduced the concept of a fantasy spectrum showing works with different levels of humor and gravitas on an overall spectrum, rather than using just strictly genre sub-classifications like heroic fantasy or swords and sorcery or grimdark fantasy or so on. Maybe a bit grimdark. The idea was to focus the tone of the game that you were trying to run on that, rather than on just general setting material like the level of magic or the scope of the overall story of the work. To an extent, this is based on the that idea that you, the viewer, knew from a setting standpoint what type of game you are running or playing in. You have picked up Pathfinder or D&D or Hellfrost, Dungeon Crawl Classics or whatever, and you're going to run a game in that with the assumptions from that as to how magic works, how flashy the combat's going to be, and what you're going to be doing. Now, from an anime recommendation standpoint, different shows that were placed up the spectrum for that episode were placed with the idea of helping players and GMs set an expectation as to what the tone of their game was going to be. So, as a GM, when you say political maneuverings and machinations could be a part of this game, you can expand on that by saying, by setting a tone of, and everyone's kind of doofuses, even you, like combatants will be dispatched. Or... Everyone is dangerous and ruthless with risks of assassination coming from your enemies, and they'll be expecting the same from you, like in Berserk's Golden Age arc. This is significantly more uh, important when dealing with a system that is itself somewhat generic within a genre or subgenre, which is still designed towards genre emulation. Lancer, for example, is a mecha RPG. So, what kind of mecha? Fans of mecha anime will tell you that mecha anime is large and contains multitudes. Are we talking a super robot game where the protagonists are effectively superheroes and fighting supervillains or giant monsters? Are we in a very gritty military setting where powered armor is as interchangeable on uniform as a soldier's rifle? 
is this a setting where mechs serve as surrogates for soldiers on a battlefield, not just representing an individual soldier's equipment, but with the mech themselves and their capabilities ultimately representing their skill, with more advanced mechs being in the hands of a more skilled pilot, perhaps even with the mechs leveling up and developing as the player characters do as well. Is this a setting where mechs are a form of lost technology and humanity is slowly relearning how to reproduce them so parts are scarce and knowledge and how to build and maintain them is precious? So, having a recommended reading in the book helps convey the tone of the setting, if it has an intrinsic one, as opposed to being a more generic system. And from a game mechanic standpoint, it helps the GM get in the headspace of figuring out, for example, for the example of the mecha game, what type of mechs the game features and in turn helps them figure out what start story they're going to tell. If you have a game that's meant for more abstract superhero inspired mechs, okay, okay, that's the type of story we're telling. Now we could go all sorts of directions, whether gritty like get a robo, um, ludicrously sit over the top like like Gurren Lagann, which also in some ways borrows from Gator Robo, but in different effects, or Camp, like um, Gao Gai Gar, or um, Odanar, whatever. It, it helps you understand what you're doing with the genre. Now, this is based, again, all this on having existing familiarity with the genre in question, but that's also okay. If I am picking up a fantasy role-playing game, I have some familiarity with the genre from other games or other works of fiction in the genre. Having a recommended reading where I recognize something or a lot of the things going in helps me lay, helps lay the groundwork for a GM like myself to build off of. That said, additional thing that's needed with a recommended needing, reading, is, or, or at least a helpful, is some notes as to why you are recommending it. Most of the recommended work sections I've previously encountered just gives a list of titles. Now, when you're doing a published book and extra columns inches equals printing costs, that's understandable. Space speed is much more at a premium when you're dealing with a physical. Um, now, however, where including information, I would say, becomes much more necessary is when you are setting expectations for your players a recommended works list created by a game master or the player serves a similar but different role than a recommended reading list created for a gm this list the one that is going to the players is ideally one that you or i as the gm or you i'm spending whatever um are making for your players specifically related to what campaign you're going to run, separate and distinct from just the system itself and what's in there, although in some cases pulling information from that as well. The list needs to set up several key ideas. What is the tone of your campaign? What kinds of characters can the players play as? What will those characters be doing over the course of this campaign? Consequently, when you're creating this list for your players, it becomes much more important good information as to why you are including that work. For example, let's say that I'm running Feng Shui, a action movie role-playing game. And in my list of examples for my players, I use the film, the John Wick films. It's important for me to include why am I, why I'm doing that. Am I including it as an example of what a player can do as a melodramatic hook? Am I including it as an example of a character that fits the killer archetype? Am I including it as an example of how the setting of the campaign will work? Or am I including it as inspiration for the players for how they can narrate fight scenes when we go through those because players are encouraged to elaborate and have characters doing more involved stunts? Or is it all of the above? It's the GM's job to adequately communicate that information to the players, as doing so helps improve the player's experience in the game and make sure everyone has fun because everyone is on the same page. Finally, there's inspiration. If you read or play enough books, read enough RPGs, watch enough movies, or what have you, you can probably get an inspiration for an NPC or an adventure hook or whatever from anywhere. 
even if it's not a work in the same genre as what you're running, provided it's in a genre that you've developed some familiarity with, at least uh, it's how it is with me. But what about genres that we, metaphorical, we aren't familiar with? Take, for example, Traveler. If you were to ask me what a Traveler game would look like based on existing works, I would probably go with either Firefly, Cowboy Bebop, or The Expanse, and then I wouldn't have it much after that. If I don't know already something about how about the setting, how it works, what the structure is, and that sort of thing, having a variety of works of recommended reading that illustrate how the setting works is helpful. If I am coming to a space opera setting, I will have a different interpretation or vibe coming away for what the game is going to look like if you give me The Expanse as a recommended work than if you give me Event Horizon or Legend of the Galactic Heroes, because each of those are three different, very different stories in terms of what the universe they're creating is. Now, if you're doing a game that has more unique spins on the genre, like Lorantha, like that, that setting when RuneQuest and Hero Quest and that sort of thing, or with Earth Dawn and how it works differently from fantasy, or with um any of that sort of stuff. Um you having this is even more important because it really helps what's set up what makes the game different in terms of oh this setting like we're, we're in, when I created it, I was inspired by this work of fiction, like Past the Land Before Fallen, or what have you, or a or I'm doing a more meso or doing a uh setting inspired by just to get out of step out of anime for a second, setting inspired by Black Leopard Red Wolf. By putting that in your reading material, it creates a radically different vibe than, say, I'm doing a fantasy setting inspired by mythology, and I'm including works that are inspired by that, that are heavily influenced and not by that. Or if you're doing a Japanese inspired fantasy, including works like 90s Hikinden OVA or Yuyasha or any or any other work that is fantastical work set specifically within Japan and has cert and what and how those works articulate with the supernatural because those two works I mentioned are very work in very different ways. Same if there's something like have you. Now, having introductory fiction in the book can help with this a lot, as can published adventures, both included in the book itself and separately, either on website or as a digital purchase on the But we're not getting many of those for published adventures these days, and even less so with independent games. The stuff that's more narrative control focused, like Powered by the Apocalypse, just um, or Forged in the Dark. Which is where having an actual play can help with this too. But again, if your game is fairly new, it may not have that. And if the game is in development and you're trying to do an actual play while before the game, this final version form comes out, that can come with its own issues. We get back to mecha RPGs for a second. Beam Saber is a mecha RPG using the that's Forge in the Dark. That's based on the Blades in the Dark role-playing game system, where you play a group of mecha pilots. Now, the Friends at the Table podcast did a actual play podcast campaign for Beam Saber titled Partisan. However, the campaign was done while the game was in development and the rules were in flux, which, at the time, led to some rules calls that caused me to draw incorrect conclusions about how the game worked in play, when which almost turned me off Beam Saber in particular and Forged in the Dark games in general. And on top of that, and this is not a mark against Austin Walker and the Friends of the Table uh, podcast cast of his group. They are awesome, they are awesome people. Um, but Austin and his group of players on the podcast have a level of creativity that they take to their games that breaks with con from convention in ways that can be very intimidating. And which 
might not help new players get the hang of the rules. Again, first off with the fact that the version of the rules games is an early version side, that won't help as much that the way that Austin Walker and company does it does not help as much when it figures out the type of stories that you're going to tell. By way of explanation, if you've listened if you haven't listened to any of the Friends of the Table campaigns, they do a series of one shot or series of one shots for each campaign to build and flesh out the world of the game. Those are often done with completely different systems than the system that is used for the main campaign itself. On the one hand, this makes for really great, really well fleshed out settings because there's a lot of, because aside from any other work that Austin has done on his um, getting before we actually get to the game, there is additional work that's done with the players, figure out what the world they're going to do the game in the first place is going to be. On the other hand, I find it incredibly, tremendously intimidating game master in ways that I am not intimidated by, for example, critical role. Um, honestly, I am almost more scared of the Friends of the Table effect than I am of the Mercer effect. So to sum up, including recommendation material, are the books, movies, TV shows, comics, and manga, podcasts, or whatever. Um, helps new players and GMs with the system, the genre, or role-playing in general. With the answer to the question that we've all asked at some point when we picked up a tabletop RPG. Question of, okay, I've got the book, what do I do with it? So, when you're making a game that is coming out and you're doing something significantly different from other tabletop games, um, other types of genres and types of stories that you're portraying, especially if you're something more niche and indie, it is helpful to me as a GM and as a player to have some recommendations for what, particularly if you're creating a game that has a particular own in mind, which jumps from jump when you have recommendations, work of fiction, be they anime, manga, novels, TV series, or even podcasts, to help convey what your interests were and what inspired you to make this and what you are trying, what vibe you are aiming. And similarly, as it uh, for GMs out there, when you are creating your game, or when you're planning out what campaign you are going to run, it is tremendously worthwhile, particularly if your players are new to a genre or new to a game to have a or you're very familiar with it because you're trying to set expectations to put together a list of works and say here is what this is supposed to be like here is what we are aiming for for the time we're doing a western decide whether you're talking john ford or whether you're talking sergio leo if you are doing if you are doing a uh, horror it is important to know whether we are talking um, 70s slasher, 70s western slasher, slasher, Magiello, or are we talking something more supernatural? We're talking Hammer. Um, and if you are doing science uh, fantasy, it's worth knowing, hey, are we doing Conan? Are we doing Lord of the Rings? Or are we doing what is now considered Traditional Dungeons and Dragons inspired heroic fantasy. Next installment, we will get into our spectrum for cyberpunk and get into my thoughts on what goes into the genre and the various flavors with. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.